Good to see you all, and uh, glad that you're here to uh, worship with us, and uh, uh, praise the Lord for the good music today, and especially talking about the subject of fear, and we're going to look at that today. A couple things as a reminder, uh, this Saturday at Karis Park, uh, there's a call to worship, and from uh, about 1 o'clock to, I think, 8 o'clock, I think there's going to be bands there from different churches uh, singing at Karis Park, and we're just trying to call the city uh, to hear God and to uh, listen to some good music. So our, I think uh, one of the bands from our uh, neck of the woods is going to be playing at 1 o'clock, but you go down there. There's going to be lots of food and uh, entertainment and just a great place to hang out for a little while next Saturday, Karis Park. Also, um, uh, we, uh, we, I said last week there was two spots available for the trip to Israel in November, and uh, one of them has been taken and possibly the second, but if you're interested, please talk to Doreen. Uh, I uh, wanted you to see this, um, this particular website. It's called Public Square. How many of you have heard of Public Square? A few of you. And uh, here it is. And um, it is America's marketplace. It's the alternative to Amazon. And uh, we all use Amazon, but they are such a woke com company. And this company has decided to take all the businesses, if you have a business and you want to advertise on a conservative website, a place where people can find you that are conservatives and want to support conservative businesses, Public Square is doing that. So it's a uh, great company, and I highly recommend it to you. Uh, last thing, uh, several uh, people I talked to this past week, this, this week, matter of fact, someone I talked to said, last night I went to see Sound of Freedom. So how many of you this past week you went? Oh, good, good. And so if you haven't gone, go today. Uh, they're, it's playing. It's number one film in, the, in the America. And it is having a huge impact on the culture. God's using it. Jim Caviezel, uh, he made a statement. He said, um, you know, <clears throat> uh, the Bible teaches that there is good and evil. And uh, we are to stand and be on the side of good. But he said the church is trying to be middle, middle ground. And um, God didn't call us to be in the middle, did he? He said, either you are for me or against me. There's no middle ground. And I'm thankful that Cross Point Church is not a middle ground church. Amen. Um, <clears throat> we want to continue our study on the uh, study of Elijah using this time to talk a little bit about depression as we have the last few weeks. Let me bring you up to speed. The Bible says that God raised up this prophet Elijah and we don't know much about him. We don't really know anything about his hometown, don't know the uh, occupation he had, his parents, uh, anything at all. But God brought him out of nowhere. The Bible describes him as a hairy man with a big leather belt. And uh, he came out with a voice for God. And God sent him to confront wicked King Ahab and his more wicked wife Jezebel uh, and the nation had turned and left him and were worshiping idols, the Baal uh, worship. And he uh, came to bring the judgment of God. He said, it will no longer rain in this nation until I say so. And turned around and left. And then God took him and put him by a brook of water. He, it was a, a hiding place. And God fed him with that uh, uh, with remember he, he brought in blackbirds with food and uh, Chick-fil-A came flying in and so they had he had water had food and he stayed there for several months until the brook dried up and then God again took care of him sent him to a Gentile little city where he met a woman who was a widow and she was starving to death she was ready to die and she he said uh, fix me a meal. She said, I only have one meal left. She, he said, give it to me first and God will feed you the rest of your time. And so uh, she did. And then God performed a great miracle. I hope that you remember what he did. 
and she had a son. And this young boy became, I'm sure, close with uh, Elijah because he was there probably two years in her home. And uh, we don't know what happened. We don't know what the illness was, but the boy got sick and died. And you remember she was distraught. She believed that God was judging her for her past sins. And then again, Elisha uh, stepped in and performed a great miracle. And I hope that you remember what happened. And then <clears throat> three and a half years passed. God says to Elisha, now it's going to rain. And, uh, and he told him what he, how he wanted him to do it. He went and challenged uh, the prophets of Baal to a contest. He said, let's have a gunfight at Mount Carmel. And the God who answers by fire is the true God. And so for five or six hours, prophets of Baal danced around, prayed to their God, send fire, send fire, nothing. And when they were done, Elijah said, uh, my turn. He said, put water on that offering. Uh, do it again. Do it a third time. And they dumped water all over it. And then he kneeled, prayed, and bam, God brings an incredible fire that licked up the offering, the wood, the stone, the dirt, the water, everything. And uh, it was at that time that um, Elijah was convinced that revival was going to sweep now the nation. He went back to the capital and was waiting for God to do uh, a great movement upon the people's hearts. He, he heard the people shout. He heard the people clap. He, heard the, he saw the people fall and say, Jehovah is the true God. Jehovah is the true God. And so he was convinced that God was going to continue that movement. But he found out that miracles do not change hearts. Miracles don't change hearts. God's word does. And so the queen the next day, you remember this wicked, demon-possessed woman sent a message to him and said, by this time tomorrow, you're going to be like the, the prophets that you killed. And so Elijah faced a decision. He faced a decision at a time when he was out of gas, physically, out of gas emotionally, and pretty low spiritually. He'd, he'd given all he had. And uh, for some reason, at that point in his life, uh, he made the wrong decision. He was filled with fear and chose to run. And uh, he made two common mistakes. One, he looked for the harvest too soon after seed sowing. So often we want God to work on our timetable. We pray and say, okay, God, I, I repent. I'm sorry. Now would you give me a job like today? And we don't give God time to work and to bring about a harvest. And it takes time after you've sown seeds. And then he forgot nothing is in this world is more hollow than popular applause. He heard the people shout. He heard them say, Jehovah's the true God. They fell on their face, but they didn't follow through. And so often we are deceived by uh, the fickleness of people's hearts. So his unmet expectations caused him to run. He ran 100 miles south, left his servant, which was basically his resignation, went another day's journey into the wilderness, found a little small tree to set underneath, and he prayed, and he said, I'm done. It's enough. Take my life, God. So he was his... He was his low as he'd ever been in his life. And um, it was clear from his reaction that not only was he deeply disappointed, but he was now depressed. The farther he walked on his journey, the more depressed he came to the place he finally said, God, I want you to just go ahead and take me home. We've discussed there are many reasons why people go into depression. Many times it's a, an event that takes place that's disappointing. Sometimes it's not an accident. Sometimes it's a disease, and all of a sudden they discover that they have Parkinson's disease, or they have MS, or they have a stroke, and they're left paralyzed, or uh, they find out they have advanced cancer. And those events 
have an impact upon you emotionally, and it can send you in the wrong direction. Now, Elijah um, gave way to fear. It dominated his decisions. And all of us have experienced that. We've had events take place, and our first reaction is to run, uh, to not look to God, not trust God, but to lean on our wisdom, our flesh. And uh, so that's what Elijah did. It seems strange that a guy that was so powerful that he was used by God in such a miraculous way would the next day flip and run. But it can happen to anyone. So the question is, now God is watching this. God sees him running in fear. What, what is God going to do? How is God going to respond to this, uh, this servant? Now, you remember that <clears throat> when God sent him to the brook, he, he fed him with water and, and food, but no angel. Then he took him to the widow's house, and he had the widow miraculously feed him, but no angel. But when he is at his lowest, when he is in depression, God sends an angel. Matter of fact, I think it was the angel of the Lord, which is a pre-incarnate visit from Jesus himself who came and laid his hand on him as to say, I, I'm here, I love you. And God was not in any way condoning what Elijah had done. He was trying to break through Elijah's fear with his love, with his compassion, with his patience, and saying to Elijah, um, what, what are you doing here? Now, um, God is consistent in trying to reach people that have followed him and then got hurt somehow, did something, and walked away. Uh, remember Peter? Um, the Bible says that Peter, the night of the trial of the Lord, just before he was crucified, he denied the Lord three times uh, vehemently. And, um, and then the Bible says he wept in repentance when he looked at Jesus and um, then the Bible says he, Jesus rose from the dead and was ministering to the disciples and sent a message to the disciples. And it said this, go tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. So the angel said to the messenger, go tell the disciples to meet him in Galilee, but Say it particularly to Peter. See, God knew where Peter was at emotionally, and he said a special word to him, I want you to come. I want you to come. And so <clears throat> God will continue to do that. And if you're here today and you are in the wrong direction, uh, you are in a place where you shouldn't be, God is saying to you, will you turn around? Will you come back? If you will, God says he'll forgive you. And set you free again. You know, it's easy to look at Elijah and find fault. Um, I have found I need to be really careful about throwing the first stone and realize that if a man like Elijah could make that mistake, anybody can do that. Anybody can be filled with fear and react in the wrong direction. And so we need to be careful because there's few of us that have such a walk that we have not fallen away at some time, been fainted in the day of adversity. So when we see heroes of, of the Bible fall, one of the things that confirms in my mind is that we have a Bible not written by man, but God. See, if man was writing that, we would not see the biblical characters in a bad light. We would see them all in good light. We would not see them warts and all. We would just see them shining, all the good stuff. They would be like, you know, Rambo and all the heroes. And so uh, it's another proof that God writes both sides, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He did about Moses. He did about Peter's denial. He even did about 
good Paul and Barnabas who were, uh, went on their first journey together. And then Barnabas decided that he wanted to take John Mark back on the second trip. And, and he had fallen away uh, from them in the first trip. And uh, Paul said, no, he's not going. And Barnabas said, no, 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 he, he is going. We got to restore him. Paul said, no, he's not going. Barnabas said, well, then I'm not going. And Paul said, okay, you're not going. So <clears throat> good men can even separate over crises that all of a sudden take place over personalities. So we pick up the story. After Elijah has gone 40 days, God feeds him special, uh, special water from the brook of, I think, the river of God. He feeds him this warm bread. He wakes up, coal fire, warm bread. I think it was jalapeno cornbread, you know. And uh, you say, well, it doesn't say that. Well, it says bread. It could be. And since I'm telling the story, it is. <laughs> and uh, so, <clears throat> so Elijah comes to Mount Sinai, Mount, uh, it says Horeb, same, same mountain, where God had met with uh, some people and did some great things on that mountain. And he, uh, he takes him from a man who is filled with fear, and he's going to try to minister to him. And so what's God going to do? It says he entered a cave there and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, God could have said a lot of things. When you read the Bible, you should ask yourself, Well, why did God say that? Why didn't God do something? I mean, why didn't God speak to him and say, Hey, you're, you're down, dumps, and... Let me help you. Let me love you up in here. God asks a question. You know, sometimes we want to preach to somebody. Sometimes we want to preach to our teenagers. And God said so often to us, here's a question. You know, a question is a very powerful thing. When asked at the right time, in the right way, it can have profound um, results in our hearts because it brings us to a place where we have to kind of look within and judge our own hearts and wonder what's going on inside. So God is good at asking questions, and I would encourage you, before you start barking, ask the question. Ask another question. And so God asked him, what are you doing here? You are a soldier of God, Elijah, so what are you doing here? Um, there's no one to preach to here, Elijah. So what are you doing here? There are no young prophets to teach here. So what are you doing here? And he had left what God had called him to do. I hope that you hear that, that question sometimes when you decide... You know, I'm not going to go to church today. I'm just going to kind of flake out. I hope God says to you, what are you doing here? And uh, sometimes we know people that are running from the Lord. And I hope that they hear today that question, what are you doing here? So God uh, asked the question and then Elijah responds, remember? He said, Lord, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, but the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. And they, they're looking to kill me. So his response to God's question reveals something about his heart, doesn't it? Says that Elijah was focused on Elijah that he was feeling sorry for Elijah, that he felt like God had let him down. God didn't, he didn't follow the plan. Elijah had a plan. God didn't come through, and, and Elijah now was feeling sorry for himself, and he was in a place where he was questioning. Now, <clears throat> um, God wants us to know that sometimes he puts us in a place and then he asks us questions. And, um, and he responds this way and then God comes back 
and he says this. God says, go out and stand on the mountain in the Lord's presence. So you're, you're questioning who I am and my power. So he said, at that moment, the Lord passed by. So the Bible says that here's how God responded to Elijah's self-pity. That like, God, you didn't show up. You weren't, you weren't the God that I thought you were. And God said, no, I'm, I, I'm, I got still plenty of power. And so at that moment, God said he sent a great wind, a tornado that just tore the mountains up. Rocks are flying everywhere. Then he, he said he was not in the, the wind. And then after that, a, an earthquake, and he shook the whole mountain. Boom. And then he said he, he was not in the earthquake. And then a fire swept all over, and God said he was not in the fire. God was saying, I think, several things to Elijah. Uh, one, that uh, I still have plenty of power, Elijah. I still am the God that's omnipotent. I can do anything I want at any time. And so God was trying to get Elijah's attention. And God was saying to him, I want you to see through your eyes who I am, that I have plenty of power, that I'm able to rescue you. I could have stepped in if you would have waited and prayed. And so God is trying to help him come to a place of change. Now, <clears throat> God then says something that he only says here. This is one of the most unique passages of Scripture. And it's a very powerful thing because God says it in a, in a way that only he can. Watch. At the end of that, he says, And after the fire, a voice, a soft whisper, God said, I'm not in the fire, the wind, the tornado, the earthquake, big, bold. He came to Elijah and said, I'm right here. I'm right next to you. Elijah watched all this happening from the cave, all this incredible events and the power. And, uh, and he came to him in a soft whisper. And Elijah heard it, and he wrapped his face with his, his robe, his mantle, went out, stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly, the voice came a second time. What are you doing here, Elijah? So in the quietness of this moment, while he was standing there, after it all had settled down, then the voice comes. Elijah, what are you doing here? And I think God got close because you have to be close to hear the whisper of God. And God was trying to reach his heart. So what was God trying to do? The second time he asked him, he said, what are you doing here? Now this passage has uh, a lot of importance, I think, to us. During this time when he said to him, what are you doing here? Elijah responds again and, and he gives him the same reply in verse 13. He says the very same thing. Now, when God asks you a question, he wants you to pause and be careful how you respond. And if you don't respond the right way, God is patient and He'll come back around a little later and he'll ask you again through circumstances and through his word the same question. Why are you still here when you should have taken several steps and you should be here? Why have you allowed fear to stop you when you should be further down the road? And God is trying to speak to our hearts. Elijah does not even answer with a question. He doesn't say, well, Lord, I, I, I want to I ask you a few questions here. I, I'd like to know, why didn't you do mighty works again? Why didn't you change hearts? Why, the people fell down. They all said you, and then I get this note. Of, why did you let that happen? Is it all right to ask God questions? Absolutely. 
I hope that you have some questions for God. It's not our right to question God. There's a difference, isn't there? Asking a question is different than questioning what God is doing. That violates his will, his sovereignty. I don't have a right to challenge it, his sovereignty, his will. But I can't ask questions, and that's how God was confronting him. So God confronts us with the Holy Spirit within our hearts. That's why it's so important that we come to church, because it is the one time during the week that you sit quietly, silently, for several minutes. And the Holy Spirit has an opportunity to whisper in your ear. Why are you here? Why have you been living this way? And God looks for opportunities to break into your life. But he has a hard time because we are so flooded with all kinds of voices and music and and distractions. And he has to put us in a place where he can speak to us. When our children were teenagers, we said to them, here's the rule at the spear house. Whatever you do wrong, and we asked you, what did you do? We want you to know if you tell us the truth, the consequences will not be near as severe as if you lie to us and we find out you lied. So tell us the truth, and I promise the consequences will not be near as severe. And uh, <clears throat> we would find out things that they did, and then sometimes we would go back and say, <clears throat> Let me ask you one more time. Now, before you answer, think. Where were you last night at 1230? So I want you to know God often will come to us the second time trying to appeal to us. Elijah refused to be comforted and to shake off the depression that had trapped him. So God is trying to get Elijah to confess something, to confess something. Don't always think, Elijah, that I'm in the bold, spectacular demonstration like the power on Mount Carmel. God said to Elijah, you were convinced that people should repent following that miracle, but miracles don't change hearts. The word of God changes hearts. So what's the one thing, what is the one thing that can change a spiritually cold heart? You know people that you've tried to witness to, you've tried to share with them, they put up both hands, say, shut up, I don't want, I don't want to hear that. And, the, and you, you just feel like their heart is so hard and they're cold and you wonder how, what can break through. And you, you wish somehow they would see a miracle or hear a miracle or something. But I, I want you to know, there's only one thing God said will work. And um, he said, faith, what, you, can't ha- you can't get to God without faith, right? So he says, so faith comes by hearing. You know why God asked you to come to church? So you can listen to the word of God. Every church should be teaching the Bible. And it's the Bible that the Holy Spirit uses to speak to your heart. And it's the only thing that can bring you into salvation. If you're here without Jesus, the only way for you to get to him is through faith. Faith believing what the Bible says about you and your condition and your need to invite him into your life. So faith comes by hearing. You have to listen to the word of God. And then hearing by the scriptures. So God is saying to you, you need to take time to listen to the scriptures because that is what brings about faith. Now, <clears throat> you've heard people say, you know, I don't go to church. I'm done with church. I, I go to my church. My church is out hunting in the wilderness. I go out and go down the river and I, I, I'm in the wilderness. That's my church. Well, <clears throat> you, can, you can see God's power 
in wilderness. You can see God's handiwork in the wilderness, but you will never hear God's voice in the wilderness. You will not hear the word of God out there. It's like saying, I want to, uh, I want to get to know Elon Musk. Um, so I bought one of his cars. And, uh, and, I, and I sit in the car and I, I talk to Elon. Well, the problem is, he's not there. You have one of his products. You have the re- the, kind of the result of his power. And like that, you can go out in the wilderness and you can see God, his work, but you will not hear his voice. You will have to get to know him personally. And you would have to have a face-to-face with Elon to know him personally. Now, on one end of the spectrum, people say, if you're going to get to know God, you have to get to know him through the spectacular. There are people who preach that God will come to you in a miracle. God will come to you when you speak in tongues. God will come to you in a special healing. God will come to you in a spectacular emotional way. You say, well, doesn't God do that? There's nothing in Scripture that says that that's how God speaks to people. God chooses to do that on rare occasions. But there's nothing in Scripture that says that is how God's going to break through in people's lives. There's only one thing that God said he will use to break down the heart of an unsaved person. It is the Word of God. You say, I don't know that I agree with that, Pastor. I just think that's your interpretation. Really? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. So let me share a passage of Scripture with you. This teaches a profound truth. It says there was a rich man who was dressed in purple. That was the color of rich people in that day. And fine linen and lived in luxury. He, he was the one percenter. And um, at the gate, at his gate, uh, laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table, just the garbage. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. This guy was in bad shape. Time came when the beggar died. Because of his belief, the angels carried him into paradise next to Abraham. And the rich man, he also died and was buried. So now there's a big funeral, a lot of a lot of echoes about his, all of the stuff he had. And uh, I'm sure there was some hired preacher that told everybody he was in heaven. And the rich man died, and in hell, it says, in Hades, where he was in torment. He looked up, saw Abraham far away, and Lazarus standing beside him. And so he said, he called to him and said, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus. And dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm, I'm in agony in this fire. I've had people say, you know, I, 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 I'm going to hell. I, I don't care. I said, really? He said, well, that's where all my friends are. We're going to party on in hell. Not according to that verse, you're not. And uh, <clears throat> he didn't ask for a cup of water. He didn't ask for a big cooler. He asked for a drop of water. And um, Abraham responds. Abraham said, son, remember, you in your lifetime receive your good things while Lazarus received bad things. Now he is comforted here. and You're in agony because of your decisions before. And beside all this, between us and you, a great gulf, great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot nor can anyone cross over from there to us. And he answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's, to my brother's house, my family. So I want you to know, people that die without Jesus are praying for lost people to be saved. Some of us don't even pray for lost people to be saved. They're praying that people don't come to this place of torment. It says in Luke, it goes on to say, for I have five brothers, the rich man said, let 
him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said, hey, they have Moses, the first five books of the Bible, and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Faith comes by hearing. Let them hear the word of God. The rich man came back and said, no, 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 Abraham, they won't listen to the Bible. But if someone came from the dead, and goes in them. They'll repent if they saw a miracle. And he said to him, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, the word of God, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. What a powerful story of this truth that only thing that changes the heart of an individual is not the spectacular. And people who so often come to Jesus over the spectacular Don't stay long. It is the word of God that brings conviction of sin. And you can only come to Jesus if you are a sinner. You understand you're a sinner in need of a savior. So God wants us to know that these are two compelling truths about the power of the word of God. God was saying to Elijah, Jesus took upon himself all the judgment, the fire, the wind, uh, the uh, earthquake, were all a picture of judgment. And God was saying that I draw people not through judgment. I, I try to draw them through my love, my grace. Listen to this verse. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, Or do you despise, that's a big word, the riches of his kindness, restraint, patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to do what? Lead you to repentance. God said, the reason I haven't judged you, the reason I keep trying to turn you, the reason I keep trying to love you and and help you is because I just want you to see, I want you to go this way. It's a better way. Not only will you miss hell and make heaven, but your life will be filled with purpose and meaning, direction. So God wants us to know that Jesus took the judgment. He took the wind, the fire, the earthquake upon himself so we could enjoy the peace and the grace of God. And if God cannot reach you through his love and mercy, chances are he's not going to reach you through his judgment, through the warning even of hell. Now, I want you to see one last thing before we're finished. Um, He says then something to Elijah that is really critical. He then says this to him. The Lord said to Elijah, go and return by the way you came. To me, that's like God saying, you shouldn't be here you should go back the way you came. Most of us could say, I've been there. I've done that. I've gone someplace I shouldn't have been, and I get there, and I've wasted time and resources and opportunities, and now I've got to take the time to go back the way I came, make amends, and get things right in order to go again. I want you to know, God is not in the business of tossing you away. God doesn't toss Elijah away. He reassigns him, but he, does not, he doesn't lose his relationship. And you'll never lose your relationship to Jesus if you know him. But he is, has a word for you that's important for you to hear. Um, in verse 15, he says, When you arrive, I want you to anoint Haziel, king of Aram, and then Jehu, he said he's going to be the next king of Israel, and then he says this, Elisha, we're talking about Elijah, he says, I've got a young man by the name of Elisha, and note the last four words, prophet in what? Your place. 
he said, I'm taking you out. I'm going to use somebody else. Now, <clears throat> there was one thing that was missing from Elijah's conversation with God. What was it? What was it that he was trying to get Elijah to come to that place of change? God wanted Elijah <clears throat> to simply say, Lord, I, <laughs> I, I, it's obvious why I'm here. I'm here because I ran from where I should have been. I was filled with fear, and I gave in to that. I've made all these decisions and I feel disappointed and I'm now depressed and that's why I'm here and I shouldn't be. Would you forgive me? Elijah never said that. And so God changes his course of direction. God is kind and he's patient and he rewards him. And he doesn't do this instantly. It takes time, a few ta years really before Elisha takes over, but the decision has been made. So I want, to, I want you to remember this as we close. Not everyone gets a second chance to serve the Lord after willfully disobeying his will. Not everyone gets a second chance. Um, Peter did. Peter denied the Lord, and he repented, and God restored him and gave him a second chance. But that was not true with Moses. You remember Moses was told the first time, strike the rock. The second time he was said, speak to the rock. And he didn't speak to the rock. In anger, he struck the rock, not once, but twice. And as a result of that, he lost his favor with God and he lost the opportunity to go into the promised land. Listen. Moses said, at that time, I begged the Lord, please let me cross over and see the beautiful land, the other side of the Jordan, that good hill country in Lebanon. Let me, please let me go in. But the Lord was angry with me on the account of you and would not listen to me. And the Lord said to me, that's enough. Do not speak to me again about this matter. Wow. Wow pretty harsh. To whom much is given, much is required. Moses should have not violated God's clear commandment. And um, not only did he not go in, but Aaron, his brother, did not go in either. Now, <clears throat> Samuel, the, Samuel the prophet told King Saul, <clears throat> you're getting ready to go to war to fight for Israel. God will be with you. You wait, camp, don't go into the fight till I arrive. When I arrive, we'll have a special sacrifice. We'll call upon God and he will give you his favor. So the Bible says that the army showed up. King Saul was there. And the Bible says just as he finished offering the burnt offering, King Saul decided that he would be the prophet, that he would be the priest of God, he would go in and he would perform the sacrifice. That was not his responsibility at all. Samuel arrived right after that and, saw, and Saul went out to greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? <laughs> you, ever, you ever hear that? What have you done, boy? And Samuel, or, or Saul answered, well, when I saw <clears throat> the troops were deserting me and, and you didn't come in the appointed days, that's not true. And the Philistines were gathering at Michmash. I thought the Philistines will now descend on me at Gilgal and I haven't sought the Lord's favor. So I, I forced myself to offer a burnt offering. I mean, I didn't want to. I just made myself do that. I made myself be disobedient. Samuel was not impressed. And Samuel, the prophet, said to King Saul, you have been foolish. You have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God gave you. It was at this time that the Lord would have permanently established your reign over Israel. 
But now your reign will not endure. The Lord has found a man loyal to him. Who was that? David, yeah. And the Lord was, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not done what the Lord commanded you. So <clears throat> God wants you to know you'll never lose <clears throat> your position as a son, a child of God. But <clears throat> if you don't keep walking in obedience, you may not have the opportunity to continue to serve the Lord. There's nothing that God can do quicker than replace somebody that gets out of step with him. And so if you decide to do your own thing, God will replace you that quick. Someone said, you want to know how fast God, how long it will take God to replace you? Put your fist into a bucket of water. Pull it out. Watch how fast the hole fills up. <laughs> God, God always has somebody in reserve. Nobody indispensable. So God said, walk, keep walking, keep taking steps. Don't allow fear to do, derail you, to stop you, to back you up. Because God said <clears throat> you could lose the opportunity. God saved you to represent him on this earth. Depression is a hard thing. You and I are responsible to walk in the light, to help people that are struggling emotionally, that have fallen out with the Lord, that have wrong assumptions about who God is, to help them see clearly and to lift them from the darkness back into the light. And one of the ways that we do that and one of the ways that we stay walking in the light is to stay thankful. The quickest way to joy is gratitude. And God wants us to practice even when we don't understand, even when circumstances change, and then the next day it seems like it got worse. God said, give thanks. He's in control. All things work together for good. So even though you can't see it, God said, be thankful. I'm still in charge of your life. I haven't left you. And if you'll stay grateful, God will keep you in the light. Let's bow our heads and word of a prayer. Music team's going to come. We're going to sing a song that <clears throat> has kind of been our theme song for the year, Gratitude. And, um, and I, I want you to sing this to the Lord. And I want you to sing from a heart of gratitude. You may be really in the hurt today. Your heart may be broken over circumstances and you're wondering where God is. Does he care? Does he love you? And I want you to know he'll come. You'll hear him speak if you will give him an opportunity to speak to your heart in the quietness of gratitude. God is looking for you to come and meet with him tomorrow morning in the quietness of your devotional time when there's no distractions when he can speak to you from the pages of the word of God and whisper in your ear, here's a word for you. So that's what God wants you to do today. I pray that you'll be filled with gratitude as we sing to him. Let's stand to our feet, sing to the Lord this wonderful, powerful song. <clears throat>
except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response. I've got just one move. With my arms stretched wide, I will worship you. So I'll throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah if you're here today and you'd say pastor pray for me I'm in a place where I need to get back with Jesus. I'm not where I should be. I know that he's spoken to my heart. And I want to feel his favor again in my life. And you'd say, pray for me. Would you raise your hand this morning and remember me in prayer? Amen. Somebody else. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope this morning <clears throat> you'll know how much Jesus loves you. If you're here without Christ in your life today, you can invite him into your life. I would be glad to pray with you after the service. So, Lord, I, I pray that during this time, you would hear our praise, hear our thanksgiving. The joy of our heart is to know you. Thank you that there's power in your word. And in the brokenness of our life, when we open the pages of Scripture and read, the Spirit of God whispers in our ear, here's a word for you. So Lord, may we be faithful to meet with you and hear that powerful whisper. Lord, I, we, are, we are blessed, I am blessed to be in a church that's not a middle of the road church, but a church that's all in, that's willing to stand be fearless in a day filled with so many compromising people. May we stand with courage and boldness and a word of love to those who need to turn around. Bless this church as we go into our mission field. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Bruce Spear from Cross Point Church. I want to thank you for tuning in and watching one of our messages. We do hope that the teaching of the Word of God will impact your life and cause you to want to walk closer to the Lord Jesus. I hope that you will also consider supporting the Cross Point ministry so that we can do more for the cause of Christ. If you have questions about your spiritual walk, especially about how to invite Jesus into your life, I hope that you'll call us. God bless you. And again,